the, the, the hardest part of, about attending uh, European shows is um, the being able to resist. I want one of those and two of those and three of those of all the breeds. I mean, they they have such phenomenal traits, traits in some of their rabbits, and you think, oh, I could really use this for this and that for that, um, and and that's difficult sometimes. They're they're very focused on color, and they're very focused on um, uh, the fur. Uh, right. Whereas here, we're we're very much about bone structure and skeletal structure, and the way the muscling is. We'll go ahead and kick things off. Uh, on this episode of The Rabbit Show, we have Jeff Harden. Uh, Jeff has been in the rabbit hobby for over 50 years as a breeder, exhibitor, judge, and ambassador around the world for uh, our hobby, uh, getting to travel to a lot of different neat countries uh, and exhibiting and uh, also uh, judging at them. And uh, with Jeff's recent trip, I thought it'd be really interesting to hear about some of the differences uh, or see, hearing about his trip and uh, what he saw, as well as some of the differences uh, that the breeds are, breeders are, uh, and just how the shows are run differently than what we're used to here in the United States. So we'll go ahead and kick things off. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Thanks, David. Pleasure to be here. You bet. Um, so let's start with uh, where did you just go? And um, you were gone for a long or for a couple of weeks. Where all did you travel? Uh, yes, that was a 12 day trip. One of the, the longer trips over to Europe. Um, I started out with uh, 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 going in. I fly into to Frankfurt often. So uh, but I was going up to a show in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, in a new city for this particular show. Uh, the show is called the Nord Show. And this year it was held in uh, Hardenburg, a uh, new venue. Uh, they had to move from the, the old site in Assen to this new venue, which is a really nice venue. And it was nice to be there. So I was there several days. Um, and uh, at the end of the show, which uh, ended on a Saturday afternoon, about four o'clock, then I traveled down to France, uh, got on the Euro Tunnel, drove over to the UK and zipped up to the Bradford show, which was uh, the hundredth anniversary. Uh, for the Bradford show in Doncaster, England, uh, and then drove back to the, the Channel Tunnel uh, that evening, came back across, spent a day visiting friends in Belgium, and then a day in Holland, and then um, spent, uh, oh, I guess, four or five days then in Germany for the big show uh, there uh, in Kassel. So it was like a 12-day adventure, three shows and uh, almost 3,000 miles driven. Um, 3,000 miles. Wow. <laughs> three, three different shows. That's incredible. Yes. Yes. It was compact, but it was nice. You know, one trip and get to three, see three shows in three different countries. Uh, it, it was kind of nice. And, and you, and you did bring stock and showed there. I did not this year. No. Um, I have shown at the, the Bradford show in the past, you know, uh, in fact, uh, I took a Belgian hair over, I guess in January 2018, or actually several Belgian hairs over, and then showed a couple shows after that, but uh, had an adult buck that uh, won the uh, adult buck class there and ended up second best hair uh, at the Bradford. So, uh, and then had third place best hair with a doe I took over same year. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to have been able to have that experience as well. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I, uh... I know how much planning logistics has to go into just taking our rabbits to convention. And I think that hauling across the coast is a, a huge obstacle. I can't imagine doing it across the ocean into another country. Uh, it does take some planning. I mean, because, you know, you, you've got to not only get out of this country with them and, and jump all the hoops, you know, uh, vet certificates, airline requirements, that sort of thing to get out. But then the country that you land in, you have to have the proper documents uh, and go through customs there. And a whole team of veterinarians have to look at your papers and look at your animals and approve them. And you can't have too many animals and that sort of thing. And you have to have a purpose and this, that, and the other. So it's a lot, it's expensive, number one, but it's also, like you say, a lot of planning and logistics. But it's, <laughs> it's fun, you know, it's fun. It's a hobby and uh, 
being able to take animals over to to have uh, other breeders, you know, critique them and uh, get the opinion of other judges is is kind of nice. Well, and and from your perspective, I mean, you or and and seeing it, how how do animals? How are breeds different in uh, in Europe versus here in the United States, just in general? Yeah, so so first I'm going to break Europe apart um, because often we talk about you know uh, Europe, and for the most part, yeah, Europe is is kind of Europe. But when it comes to rabbits, uh, for example, there's really two distinct uh, differentiations I like to make with Europe. You have continental Europe. And then you have the UK part of Europe and the UK system of judging and breeding and raising rabbits uh, is extremely different from the rest of continental Europe. Um, so I try to separate those two first um, and, and we can look at the UK first because that typically when when an American's talking about Europe, they're most familiar with the UK, mainly because the UK speaks English. So they're able to communicate easily with the breeders in the UK. They're able to read the publications, uh, you know, because they're written in English from the UK. Uh, so a lot of the American breeders' knowledge of quote unquote Europe is based on what they know from the UK, which is really different from overall Europe. Uh, but in the UK, uh, you know, they have the British uh, Rabbit Council, which is their governing body that's uh, equivalent to the American Rabbit Breeders Association. They have their own standard that they put together um, for the breeds that they have recognized there. Um, their judging system is probably more similar to our way of judging than that in continental Europe. They do judge based on a comparison type thing where they have individuals known as stewards bring the animals to the table and they pose the rabbit up for the judge and the judge goes through and basically uh, evaluates the rabbits based on a comparative system. You know, they're comparing their animals in the class one against the other and eventually they whittle it down to their, what they would say is their first place. Unlike here where, you know, we must give comments on every rabbit we judge and that sort of thing. In the UK, they give no comments during the judging process unless you know, sometimes there's friendly conversations going on and the judge will make a comment or something. But as far as the process itself, uh, commenting on every rabbit is not part of the process. And so at the end of a class, you know, rabbits just go away. You know, the judge sends them away as he determines that they're not at the top. And at the end, um, all the rabbits go back to their coops and the judge has a, uh, a book there at his table. He typically has someone keeping the book for him. And um, he will uh, make notes about his top one, two, or maybe even the top three place animals uh, as to what he thought about them. And those comments basically are in that book, uh, along with all the other results, until he sends them into Fur and Feather with his judging report. And Fur and Feather is the, the magazine that's published monthly in the UK for exhibitors and breeders. Um, and when you get the Fur and Feather magazine, the show reports, favorite show, uh, uh, British, you know, Rabbit Council sanctioned type show is in there. And then you can read the comments and the placements of the rabbits for that show. Otherwise, you really don't have a, a way of knowing the comments on your, your animal there uh, until you read the report. And it's not a long you know, comment section. It's maybe a sentence or two or a few words about the first place and the second place, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so extremely different in the UK. Then when you go over to continental Europe, continental Europe is based on a point judging system. So they judge rabbits individually, one at a time. Uh, a judge has an individual place in the show, uh, typically a small table or a small stand. Some countries, the judges stand while they're judging at this table. In other countries, they sit. You know, it's very common to see, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, the judges sitting at a table. Uh, where in Germany, you typically see the judges standing. Uh, they'll have their box with them. And in this box, they have all their judging equipment. Um, in continental Europe, every judge comes to the show with his own scale. You know, it's not like uh, the shows must provide a scale, and it's a common one. Every judge owns a scale. They bring it. It's, uh, like I say, in a box, a wooden box, typically case, and they set it up. 
Uh, every judge has a measuring device for the ears because in continental Europe, the ears on all the breeds are measured and they're recorded on the judging card. Uh, and typically there's some sort of point assessment associated with ear length um, in, in breeds that we don't think about. For example, Holland Lops, you know, when they're judging Holland Lops, which they refer to as dwarf lops over there, the ears are, are measured, you know, for length and they must be within a parameter or points are deducted from them. So in continental Europe, you have a, a point system and, and typically the show cards are broken down into positions, they call it. Uh, and the order of these positions are the same for every breed in that particular country. Positions change from country to country. In many, in many countries, the first position may be, uh, for example, the weight. And that's another thing. Every rabbit in continental Europe is weighed and the weight recorded on the card. So it's not uh, an issue of, oh, here's an underweight or overweight rabbit slipping by and winning. Uh, it's, it's known right from the get-go. You know, that's one of the first things that happens when the rabbit's brought to the table is it's weighed and that's recorded. And um, there's points typically assigned to a scale, for example, uh, from this weight to this weight is so many points. And till you get to the maximum number of points, which in many countries is like 20 points for weight. Uh, and if you're there, then you get the 20 points automatic. If you're not, then you might have a point or two points deducted. Um, those countries also have minimum and maximums. So if you're over or under, you know, you're gone right away and, and the judging process stops at that point and you make a note. Some countries in continental Europe have people who write for the judge. So the judge is truly just judging and giving comments to a writer. Uh, typically in the Netherlands, you see that. You'll have a, a judge in the Netherlands who is all concentrated on actually performing the judging. Where when you go to Europe, to Germany, for example, the judge is writing his own card. There are no writers. You never see a writer writing cards, judging cards in Germany. The judge has a card. The judge validates the, the tattoo numbers, weights, everything is handwritten uh, by that judge as part of the judging process. And all the documentations at the end are written by the judge and, and passed into the committee. So it, it does vary somewhat from country to country uh, in terms of their standards and, and the process and that sort of thing, but they're all based on a point system. So at the end of the day, uh, you'll have a rabbit that who has been given points in a number of categories, and then those category points are totaled up for a total score. And that total score then is used to determine where that rabbit ranks uh, in that particular uh, class or breed. Some countries can give um, theoretically up to 100 points as a total. Other countries like Belgium, 97 points is the maximum allowed score for a rabbit because they assume there's no rabbit that's perfect. You know, uh, a 97 score is, is really an excellent rabbit. And if you can get one to 97, that's great. But, you know, there are no 97.5s, 98, 99s, hundreds. In Germany, that's not the case. You can see 98, 98, 5, et cetera you know, given on, and I've seen a couple rabbits that get 98.5, phenomenal rabbits, amazing rabbits. Also, the philosophies are ju of judging are different in the different continental countries. For example, in Belgium, when they train judges, they say, okay, we start out that with a philosophy that all rabbits that come to a show are basically good quality animals. That may or may not be the case, for example, but they, that's their basic philosophy. And therefore we start at a point score of 95 points for a rabbit. So when the rabbit comes on the table, your philosophy is I've got a 95 point rabbit. Now I'm gonna look at the qualities of this rabbit and I'm either going to deduct points or I'm going to add points, depending on whether I think this rabbit has more than a uh, a good quality head. For example, the head, it's a, a French lop and the head is just outstanding. You know, it's almost a perfect head. Then for the head position, they would add points to that. And when they add points, they make a comment. If you deduct, for example, more than a half a point in most countries, you must make a remark on the card. So you must say, okay, why have I deducted more than a half a point? Why did I see that there was a need for a whole point? I must make a remark on that card. So the philosophies are a little different. Um, and of course the judging trainings are very different um, in the countries. 
For example, in the UK, to be a judge, you must join the, the BRC. You must have a continual membership of a minimum of three years. And once you've completed that three-year membership process with the British Rabbit Council, you can be a judge at one and two star shows. There's no test, there's no exam, nothing like that. And then once you have joined for a period of five continuous years, then you can judge their upper, you know, four or five star shows. And, and the, the thing there is you must be elected to a judging panel. So it's dependent upon clubs and, and um, their specialty clubs and that sort of thing saying, okay, uh, we want uh, John Smith to be on the Netherland Dwarf judging panel. And of course they send these names out, the members of the clubs vote. And once you get on the panel, then you can judge their upper echelon type shows. Continental Europe, uh, it's different from each country but it's normally a process um, with most countries where you begin with a small number of breeds, like three to six breeds, and you begin with the more simpler breeds. So you're not gonna get something like a, an English spot or a checkered giant, which has a lot of markings and details. You're gonna start with something that's uh, what I would call a more vanilla breed, you know, less uh, critical areas to look at. And you take a, a written exam that's very detailed on each of those breeds. For example, you start with three breeds. You're gonna have a, a long detailed exam written on each breed, each of the three breeds that you must pass. Then you will have a, an oral type exam with a, a panel of senior judges that are asking you lots of questions uh, about that, those breeds individually. And then you have a practical exam. This is typically done at shows. Uh, so you'll go there and you're basically judging these animals. And again, because it's a point system, they're able to look and see, you know, did he take off enough points? Did he uh, add points? Um, did he make the right comments? And so you must pass that practical exam. Uh, and in Belgium, on some of the written philosophical type pieces, you're actually asked about the genetics that you see, colored genetics. You're asked about uh, health physiology. So you must know, you know, digestive system, bone structure, that sort of thing. Because in Belgium, they, the philosophy is that a judge should be able to help guide people. So if you've got a new exhibitor or a new breeder and they have questions, a judge should have an overall knowledge, not just of what is written in a standard, but uh, of rabbits in general. And they can say, well, you know, this color and this color, you know, does this and you need to be aware of that and physiology physiologically with the rabbit, this is happening, you know, with feeding and whatnot. So the philosophies are different. Um, there's somewhat. Wow. Of a, uh, no, that, that's, a, that's, yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely a difference. Uh, yeah. And I wasn't even aware of that. That's, that's really neat. Yeah. Do, do uh, um, when on that point, on the point system that you're saying, um, like what's the lowest score you end up seeing on a rabbit then? Typically, um, most systems, if you go below uh, like an 82 or something like that, the rabbit's dismissed, you know, if it's that poor a quality. Uh, but um, at the shows in Europe, unlike here, every card is displayed after the judging. So those cards are mounted above the rabbit's coop. And again, that's another big difference between here and Europe. Almost a hundred percent now there was a few exceptions during covid you know for some box shows but even one day shows are coop shows so you bring your animals you put them in a coop they're bedded down for the day and they're judged uh and above or as part of that cage is a place to put the judging card so these judging cards are displayed for everybody to see and breeders over there have a very strong sense of pride in the animals they, they breed and they raise and they exhibit. So no one wants to bring an animal to an exhibition that's gonna have a low score because that card's gonna be displayed. Everyone's gonna see the score. Everyone's gonna read the comments. And so you don't see a lot of low scores at shows. Yes, once in a while you'll see an animal that is disqualified, you know, for weight or uh, a white spot or something like that. Uh, a broken tail maybe or a broken toe but you don't see you know you judge a lot of rabbit shows you've seen rabbits on the table that should have never left their house and, and part of that too is the animal welfare 
animal welfare is extremely active and involved in the showing of all animals in Europe. Uh, and for example, in Switzerland, uh, for rabbits to be shown, the coop must have a plate covering up part of the front of that cage so that when the animal is tired of seeing people, the animal can go behind that solid shield and have basically a timeout and a resting place not to be disturbed. And also in Switzerland, you must have something in that, that show cage for the rabbit to be um, quote unquote active with, entertained with, which is typically a small piece of, uh, of uh, tree bark, uh, a limb, a twig, something like that. So it can chew on it and have some sort of entertainment. Uh, so the, the rules, cages are very strictly um, monitored by animal welfare in Europe. So they have specifics for show coops. They must meet minimums based on breed and the travel boxes. You know, here we use wire, you know, carriers. Everyone uses wire carriers over there. Rabbits come in wooden boxes and the size of those wooden boxes uh, are defined by the animal welfare of that particular country. So you see very, you know, you would never see a, a, a giant breed in a, in, a, in a carrier that was meant for something like a Trianta. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. So uh, that, that's very unique as well. Do you, and the breeders there, I at least know in, in England that they use more of the wooden type of setup. Is that true for continental Europe? It is. Yeah. Like for the rabbit, rabbit traps? Yes. Yes. Wooden boxes are, you know, they don't. And in fact, um, hutches as well. You know, they, when you talk about animals living on wire, uh, you get these very um, emotional reactions from some breeders you know this is not natural that's not good for their animals even though some will say yeah that maybe it's more sanitary or something because you know uh the way the droppings are handled on a on a wire floor most will frown upon talking about wire floors and in fact there are breeders in europe that if you say that you're going to get a rabbit from them and bring it back to america and put it on a wire floor you don't get the animal. It's 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 done. That discussion is over, you know, type thing. So uh, there are commercial farms in certain countries in Europe that do use wire, but these animals are grown specifically for meat purposes, and it's a commercial operation. You never hardly see it on too many um, hobby hobby uh, type breeders. A few, a few, you know, but as a as a whole, you don't. Is an interesting difference. Sure. And, and when you see many of these wooden quote unquote cages, I mean, the carpentry work is more like cabin, cab making of cabinets, you know, here in the U.S. I mean, it is very detailed, finely done. You know, it's not like what we would think of building cages on a farm here. I mean, it's like, OK, somebody contracted and they put up this elaborate cages in these places. I mean, they really show show type barns you know when you go and see them these are really incredible it's really neat getting to see different rabbitry setups in different parts of the world when all right so focusing on i know that you import a lot of rabbits for breeders in the u.s um and and i feel that a lot of breeders are doing that for genetic diversity or they want specific traits um like Let's take pick pick a breed that is popular to come in. Uh, you know, dwarfs are have always been popular to come into the U.S. Okay, so uh, like on dwarfs, why does a breeder from the U.S. want to import dwarfs from that area? And it is and it is qualities. Um, so when you look at at breeding in general over there, which applies to the dwarfs, um, color is is very important in their judging process in their evaluation and in breeding. For over here, um, mixing of colors, even mixing of breeds, uh, you know, is not um, uncommon. You know, we don't get uh, really upset about, oh, seeing a pedigree and it may have three different colors in it, that sort of thing. Or even in some breeds, you know, you may have multiple breeds within it. Over there, it's totally different. Almost all the breeders breed specifically um, 
for a very high color standard, which a judge is going to be very critical on. Uh, for example, otter dwarfs. At the moment, if you judge many otter dwarfs, you see we've lost the, the eye ring. We've lost some of the, the ticking up on the chest. We've lost the intensity of the otter color. Um, over there, that rabbit would not be in a shed being bred from. Uh, they're very particular. But at the same time, when you look at, at colors from Europe, you will see multiple generations of the same color. So the colors are, are really genetically locked in. So if you want to improve, for example, otters, you import black otters from one of those countries, uh, like the Netherlands, you bring them in, you're gonna have animals that have all of the features for that color. The other thing is um, with the uh, animals over there, fur is very important. A lot of points on fur, typically 20 points, in most cases, 15 at the least, is on fur. So an animal that you would see over here that might have this wool behind the neck on a dwarf or this uh, longer fur in front of the ears or even a longer coat, that, that would be put off the table really quick. Um, that's not allowed. It's uh, not part of the dwarf. So not only would it not be showable, they don't breed from it. So, for example, if you're having problems over here with long coats and this woolly factor, uh, bringing animals in from Europe, you're pretty much going to get an animal that's not going to produce those problems. Um, the standards are different. So you've got to understand that, too, you know, because you're not going to bring a, a, a rabbit from Germany, which has this beautiful head, ears with very good substance, extremely dense coat, and it's going to match uh, an American dwarf profile. It, it's, it's different. Having said that, though, there are dwarfs in Germany that do not meet the German profile that are produced from litters. So some of the German breeders produce these beautiful, small, round dwarfs that fit perfectly, that can actually go from Germany into the U.S. to a U.S. show and win. And, and, and I see that happening, you know, periodically with rabbits. But, uh, I mean, typically, you've got to see in these European imports qualities that you need to improve in your herd and you bring in those genetics to do it. Um, that's. Well, and that's, and that's the thing that, uh, like you said, the breeders there are, are very focused on color. Oops. Uh, is my whole screen sharing? Yes. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very focused on color and they're very focused on um, the fur. Uh, right. Whereas here, we're, we're very much about bone structure and skeletal structure and the way the muscling is. Um, and so I know I found it fascinating of, of just seeing uh, same exact breed, you know, it's, it's an otter dwarf, like you said, or pick, pick, pick your breed. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the color over there and the fur type is different. I mean, uh, you know, a Flemish giant is, uh, has a beautiful coat <laughs> over there. Um, right still the same rabbits that they're just selected for those traits um so like and i know that that's one of those things i, I, I looked through some of the photos i mean like the, this himalayan just mm -hmm. absolutely stunning color right on on her ears and her and her feet and, and and our nose marking and it's just perfectly black and then white yeah uh, it's just it's it's incredible that the traits are even there like that that's possible <laughs> And, yeah. and the thing interesting about that, too, which is the same sort of genetics, is they're Californians. You see this same sort of, you know, jet black, big, beautiful nose markings, black feet on their Californians. And, you know, I grew up, I was very lucky. Uh, Californians was one of the breeds I had back in the 70s. And the fact that I lived uh, where I do, there was an old breeder. Uh, by the name of Hugh Betts in Tennessee. Some of the cow breeders know his name. He was probably in his 70s, way back then. His rabbitry name was Southern Beauty Californians. And I was able to visit him over there in Tennessee one time, and he had the blackest Californians, just like this. And living in the South, you know, that's not normal. But the genetics in his rabbit somehow produced these, these phenomenal colors. But you, over the years, for the most part, in, in, in a lot of these breeds, like the Californians, the color factor uh, has lost some importance, and, and the genetics to produce it seem to have, have gone away. And, and it's like no one really talks about it, you know, like, oh, this is not really 
a Californian because it doesn't have this jet black markings and this big nose marking. Where in Europe, if we would bring a Californian on the table that had the faded gray, you know, ears and the, and the dot on the nose and the, the, the white barred feet, they would they would first look at the guy and go, are you sure you grabbed the right rabbit? You know, why is this animal alive? type thing this is a a meat animal or something so it's it's really different and that's and that goes to show though i mean they're they're focused on different traits than what we are um but that's where it's a huge opportunity for someone wanting to to improve specific traits or modifiers within their herd uh it, it's it's definitely a reason to find that like you said um you know that if we don't we don't have gene pool for a specific trait, um, but over there they've been working on it. They, they've selected those modifiers over time, um, you know, and they're they're a lot. They're just cleaner on that because that's where their focus and emphasis has been. Sure. Um, the uh, I'm trying to. Um... I mean, and, and like similarly, I know I saw this otter uh, Dutch that I thought was actually really oh, stunning tan. as well. Yeah, the tan Dutch. It's a new variety. Oh, it's a tan Dutch. The that makes more Dutch. sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes more sense because I saw the undercoat on it and it was definitely tan. Yeah. Yeah, the belly. Yeah, I took a picture. I I was fortunate enough that it stood up just perfect uh, to get that picture of its belly. Um, so you could actually see, you know, what the belly of it looked like. Um but it's uh, yeah, there it is. yeah, yeah, right. Yes, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. No. I would have never have thought about putting that to tan gene with the Dutch gene on the Dutch breed. Um, it's, it's sort of amazing, you know. But um, uh, we'll see how it, lo it looks. It looks. It looks pretty. Um, but yeah, I mean, just just recognizing that you know people do bring rabbits around the world. It, there's a Breeders are breeding for different traits, and they have different gene pools they're working with. Um, it's a that, that you're a lot farther ahead if you were trying to create that variety in Dutch by going out and grabbing it from somebody that actually already has it and a breeder that's been working on it for a long time than to to try to make it here yourself. Oh, absolutely! And and one of the breeds that comes to mind that's going on here now is the Teddy Vitter. You know, we've got folks here in the U.S. that have been trying to to breed all these different types of animals to create what they have in Europe, you know, which is basically a, a wool type lop uh, about the size of a Holland lop. And, um, you know, they've, they've had them there for a number of years. And in some of the countries now, they actually have them uh, standardized. So, uh, you know, you could quickly go over there uh, and get a head start as opposed to try and get breeds here, mix them together and spend a lot of time. Correct. Correct. Yeah. You're, you're just way further ahead. Um, well, and, and like you, you've said this recently too, like on the, the champagnes, um, you know, of seeing the difference of the color traits that they're breeding for and searching for and page brand that load. Um, but I'll pull the picture in as I do the final edit, but you know, I didn't even think this was possible to, to uh, have, have that smoothness of coloring all the way on the nose and the ears and the feet, you know, but when you breed for it, all of a sudden it does happen. Yeah, it's if phenomenal. You have the gene pool, if you have the gene pool to be able to do it. Right. And and this is one breed that carries over well into the United States. I, I was asked uh, several years ago about the possibility of bringing back a pair of champagnes for a, a breeder in the Midwest. And um, I have a friend who, who breeds them. And um, I brought him, the, the breeder here, back a pair. And um, phenomenal color both surface color, under color. The type was not exactly, you know, our type, but the type, um, because of the muscling, the bone, that sort of thing, it was an easy transfer. And, and animals from that original pair uh, have gone on to win uh, national champagne shows. Uh, our ARBA convention winner goes back to some of that blood. And this year, uh, the breeder actually asked me to bring back another buck in Champagne for them uh, to get, you know, just slightly different line. But again, another dose, just because the color, you know, is phenomenal on those animals and the bone. And um, personally, you know, 
I, I really like the animals that you often see associated with Germany in the various breeds because of the bold head they have. That's one of the things um, the German breeders are known for is putting these phenomenally bold heads on their breeds. And they're also known for putting uh, this insanely dense coat. You know, they probably have some of the densest coats amongst all breeds for the most part, uh, with a few exceptions like the Belgian hair. You know, they kept the, the typical hair face and the, the thinner coat on the hair, but um, the density is phenomenal on their animals. And, and differently than here, it's uh, they have the density, but they also have finish. That it's not just a thick coat that just is dead and doesn't ever finish. It actually it's it, it's a it's a coat that actually goes back into the position sure and you can see you know the champagne picture you know that rabbit will have phenomenal density but you can see it's slick you know if you saw it on a judging table you'd go wow you know that's a nice finished rabbit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but yeah yeah totally agree i was trying to find another one of these i looked earlier of of a uh like something that also has just extreme oh that, that, that's a their picture that was the one you posted of the of the marking. So let, let's focus on that for a second. Okay. Uh, breeds over there, um, like let's say let's say let's say a Dutch. I think that's more of a, a breed that a lot of people like recognize. Here we're posing that breed with the head on the table, uh, and we want that curvature. You know, rise two thirds of their body, fall the last third. Uh, we do still obviously care a lot about markings, but like how are they posing their rabbit uh, differently? So this picture actually, and again, we separate the two countries. The UK poses totally different. You know, they're um, they're more in terms of posing that would be similar to us here in the US. And in fact, um, they don't necessarily do as much posing in the UK. Uh, they probably pose overall less, you know, the rabbits when they look at them. Um, as, as putting them in a, a proper type of setup kind of pose uh, because they are looking at their fur and their markings and their color more so. Uh, and they don't focus as, as much on having uh, feet aligned in a certain way the way we would. In, in continental Europe, um, they are all posing the animals as you would see here pretty much in this um, champagne picture. Uh, I call it a sliding board pose. Because if you think about um, going up a sliding board, you know, the steps of the sliding board, you go straight up. So you go up the feet up until the back of the neck and you get on the slide and then it just slides down to where you get to the hip and then it rounds off. They, they want the animals to be able to stand up with good bone, uh, strong ankles, slightly on their front feet. The shoulder then is, is elevated upward. And then from that shoulder, you have a decline that go that runs from the, the shoulder down to a roundness over the hip. They want their back legs parallel. They also want to be able uh, on the front feet to have a width between those front legs. So they want to actually be able to slide their hand through those front legs and have a nice wide, you know, rib cage there for that animal. And of course the 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 heads are up and the ears are up and it's um, some people refer to it as the, the proud, you know, pose because the rabbit is actually standing up, basically saying, hey, look at me, you know, here I am, which which makes sense to me. Um, and you see animals that uh, cannot stand up on those front legs or you see them, you know, they're bent or you see front legs that at the ankle um, have an extension, uh, kind of like a flipper foot, you know, that that front leg is just long and bent there. Um, which, you know, gets a deduction of points and, and, and is not desired. But um, basically throughout continental Europe, um, this is a good example of how you would see, you know, French lops posed, uh, the giants posed. Um, uh, the only exception probably to this would be um, the Belgian hare. You know, it's going to be posed up higher. You know, the front legs are longer. It's going to be posed up higher. And it's, of course, going to show an arch. And then the countries that have what we call Britannia Petites, they call Polish. 
uh, you'll see those. And of course, because of those very short bodies and again, their legs, you're going to see something that looks more like a quarter circle, you know, on those. Mm -hmm. But for your other breeds, it's going to look just like this. Um, and, and for the most part, for that body type, it's, it's somewhat uh, a cylinder. You know, you want an animal that is as wide at the shoulders as the hind quarter, and you want that depth of shoulder to carry from uh, the shoulder and chest all the way back. And so it's like a, a, a round barrel, so to speak, and you attach two legs to the front of it, and you put a short neck on it and a head, um, and then it rounds to a nice full hind quarter. Uh, they're very picky on the rear legs in terms of uh, undercut or slight cow hock where the legs are, you know, um, angled outward. That's a, that's a big uh, deduction of points. Um, so, so, are you, so <clears throat> we care because of the structure and top line. We, I know there's the huge push of looking at, hey, we have this top line on this rabbit here in the U.S. They're not necessarily looking at this as much of the top line, or do you still feel like they are like in, in continental Europe? Yeah, they do. They do look at the top line, um, but it's not – you do uh, we go to social media here and it's typically a side pick and it's like wow look at the top line look at the top line and there's a hand over the head you know we seldom see the heads on many rabbits here you know in social media we only see the back behind the head in this top line there seldom do you hear any emphasis um on on okay it's the top line it's that i think they look at the animal from a more holistic approach but they do focus on the top line. Uh, for example, uh, animals that have the dip behind the shoulder, that's, that's not desired. Animals that slide off, chopped off. So they're looking at those things. They're just not necessarily doing a whole lot of talking about them or extra emphasis on them. But uh, if you were to pick a, put a champagne up that had a little dip, you know, behind the shoulder, people would quickly comment, oh, nice animal, except, you know, this dip behind the shoulder or if it sloped quickly or chopped off um they would make a comment yeah well yeah which is under yeah i see what you're saying uh one of the other uh emphasis is like you had said was because of so much emphasis on the big big bold head uh i know that ears and substance ears is prominent on a wide range of breeds especially in continental europe um sure go ahead and talk about that for focus on that yeah so um again uh the standards do vary slightly uh from country to country in continental europe where for example um in the netherlands in belgium in france you don't see necessarily as uh strong a substance ears on all the breeds as you would for example see for example in germany where the focus is on a very strong structure of ear and a very open approach to the ear. So for almost all the breeds um, in Germany, you're looking for that rounded appearance at the top, a very nice substance and an openness, where uh, in other countries, you see a little less substance and, and they're not necessarily wanting that uh, uh, significant roundness at the top. Also the carriage of ears uh, very slightly from country to country, as does the posing. And I, I will go back to that other question about posing. Um, Switzerland uh, is, is somewhat like an island in continental Europe in terms of their standard and in what they're looking for. They actually, on their judging card, they have eight positions on their judging card where the others have seven. And the eighth position comes from posing. So they actually give points in Switzerland for posing. And when a rabbit comes to the table in Switzerland, it is to pose uh, very readily by simply the judge taking and pressing down pretty much behind its neck. And then the animal should come up. Um, and this, um, you can see it, that's the Swiss standard. And you'll see those animals on there. Almost all of them, they're standing upward on their front legs, and then they round backward. So in Switzerland, it's a whole different approach to, to the pose, um, which makes it somewhat of a disadvantage when there's a European show, 
because often the other countries are posing like we talked about with the champagne. Uh, and here comes the animals from Switzerland who are not going to have this big German, Austrian, um, Eastern European bold heads. And they're not going to pose, you know, the same way as all these others. Uh, Nordic countries, Finland, Denmark, uh, Sweden, they also tend to pose their animals that resemble more like those in Switzerland. So they're more uh, upright pose, short, round. Um, so those are some, some slight differences uh, amongst the continental countries. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. The, uh, yeah, because you're, again, you're selecting for different traits in order to get ones that, that do that naturally or uh, the ones that naturally do better, you're going to keep reading for. So that's, that's super interesting. Sure. Um, so, and, and we kind of touched on it a little bit ago as well, but I mean, that, that goes to show, like when you focus on specific traits, you're going to breed those and keep bringing them forward as long as you have being able to do it to get a different looking type of animal, even if it's the same breed in different parts of the world. Right, right. Um, and, and you can see, you know, there are, are breeds across the various countries, even here from the United States over there, that they have certain things that are in common, uh, which makes it really nice, you know, that you can get animals from different countries and, and work them into a breeding program because of that. Um, there are other traits that, you know, um, that you might see and you go, no, nope, I can't use that. Um, one being, for example, uh, the color on the giants. They have a color that is closely related to what we would call a sandy Flemish giant color uh, here, but they also have a color which is more like an agouti color that doesn't have the high rufous factor in it and tends to be a little bit more of a, a blackish gray in color. And so when you you bring an animal from Europe that has that color, you know, okay, I've got to uh, work around some of this color genetics, even though I'm going to get animals with very nice um, heads and ears and fur and that sort of thing. The steel, that's another good example too, um, because they recognize steel uh, not just in a black steel, but they also recognize it in a chestnut steel. So if you were going to bring over a steel to work with your Flemish, which our Flemish are black based steels, and you bring over a brown, you know, a chestnut based steel, you know, you're going to have some issues there to work out with color. Look at that bone though. Oh, this looks so pretty. <laughs> the, 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 the hardest part of, about attending uh, European shows is, um, the being able to resist i want one of those and two of those and three of those of all the breeds i mean they they have such phenomenal traits right. in some of their rabbits and you think oh i could really use this for this and that for that um and and that's difficult sometimes well it, no it's it's true though with having those different gene pools and having selected for it it, it's a there's a certain level of wow factor or an, an impact that it makes on somebody because you're just not used to seeing it and and you go man oh man that would really leap forward our you know if I was breeding that that would really leap forward my you know what what I'm trying to do absolutely um so if a breeder did want to get genetics what is the best way for somebody to do it there's a limited number of people that actually go over there and do it. Good. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the first thing is, is connecting with a breeder, you know, that has something that you're interested in and creating a relationship. Um, rabbit keeping in Europe truly is a hobby. Um, where, you know, over here, um, we see folks that, that, um, are in rabbits for hobby. Some are in it to be able to make money with the, with associated with rabbits, that sort of thing. But in Europe, it's strictly a hobby. So um, there's no one in Europe, for the most part, breeding rabbits uh, as an income. So the selling of rabbits and the trading of rabbits and the exchange of rabbits in Europe pretty much comes around establishing a network of friendship. Uh, so you first have to find a breeder and create a relationship with the breeder 
in order to get animals because if you don't have some sort of relationship to the to a person over there you're not going to get one of their animals you know you can write them you can send them messages you can call them you can do whatever you want to do and the worst thing you can do is offer money because it's like an insult you know i've seen a few people make mistakes say that a breeder over there has a phenomenal rabbit that they don't want to sell and they go oh well i'll give you this and i'll give you this and i'll give you this and they just keep throwing money and, and for them it's truly a hobby you know this is an animal that they want to breed with or they want to show and uh, they it's not for sale and you have to understand that when somebody says no it means no and throwing money at them is not going to get that animal so creating a, a nice friendly relationship or a network with the breeder is the first step and then of course working you know to find animals that they have that you can use qualities of uh, and once you do that um there are breeders that will ship direct. Uh, some won't. Some will tell you, okay, you need to go find an animal shipping company and they can come and pick up the animal and I'll send it. Or you find someone that happens to be going over, you know, like I do occasionally and uh, get them and see if they're willing to bring an animal back for you. Um, but the, the first step is really creating that relationship with a breeder that has animals that, that you see that you could use qualities from. Well, and, and that was uh, no. That, that thank, thank you for saying that. And that that's the reality is people don't know where to begin. And so the the, the simple way is, ah, just throw more money at it. But um, I, I'm also I I know that there's animals that sell for huge money over there as well. Uh, but but it's it's not the transaction isn't just driven by money. Right. Right. Um. The uh, I will find a picture on your page uh of like what, how, what they look like when they get shipped back because this is this is not one of them right yeah that that is actually um i think there's a picture there that has bottles associated with it as part of that so um it may be it's close to that picture that one right there yes so when they come back um that's a typical way that they would fly uh on the airplane back so um you know, I do it a little differently. Uh, I, I feel that the animal needs to have access to food and water. And uh, I provide water in two ways. Uh, you'll see the water bottles that are on the outside, but also on the inside is a cup underneath that water bottle because we know that, you know, these water bottles have that little um, a metal ball at the bottom of it. And every time it gets bounced, you know, water can leak out. And so uh, if you just put a water bottle on the outside, it's going to bounce enough that the, the water is going to come out of the bottle. And then of course the bedding, you know, gets wet and the rabbit's traveling, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours in a damp box. So I actually put cups underneath of where those water bottles are. So any water that gets bounced out, bounces in the cup and then of course they can consume it and i put a, a small amount of water in the cups to begin with but uh, they all travel in boxes uh wooden boxes similar to that um and depending on the time of year uh the box can be altered slightly so for example if they're traveling in a more hotter type of month uh the box in the back instead of having small holes the whole um the the entire back would be like the front it would be one piece of wire going across the entire back and then of course the box varies based on the on the breed but that's uh that's actually four red-eyed white bucks that uh came from a, a very good breeder uh in germany hartman henschen and came back with me to go to a to a breeder here in the states is this also a common box that they would use for like taking their animals to the show or is this truly just for transporting no um so this box would be the same box that they would use to take to the show with uh two exceptions they would not have the holes in the openings the round holes openings on the back or the sides so those two things uh have been added just for transport so everything else about that box uh would be typical except you know they're not going to have uh the water bottles on the outside some of the breeders um do put food water cups and in fact i have a company now in germany that actually sells the easy crocs um from the u.s because uh i was using them over there and uh breeders saw them and liked them and they contacted me and said hey 
uh, we've got a lot of breeders that like your cups and we'd like to start selling these cups here in Germany for the European breeders. And so I made arrangements. And so now they actually, so you'll see some easy crocs now appearing in some of the, the travel boxes. But uh, other than those things, that would be a box that you would see coming into a show uh, in Europe. Um, something else I was gonna ask about the box, but I can't. Oh, well, I, something that I, I'm curious on. When you were saying like the breeders go to the show, they're very prideful of what they bring. Um, how how many rabbits would a breeder end up bringing to a show? Okay, so again, it's somewhat uh, country. You know, uh, it varies by country somewhat, uh, and part of that is because of what the show structure is in the various countries. So, if we look first at the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, um, at a show, you're able to show. Um, young animals and old animals or adult animals and you're able to show them in bucks and does so basically you have four classes that you can enter in and they do not show in, in the normal dutch system collections of animals so you enter your animals as singles very similar to like we would do over here uh so over in the netherlands you know someone may show one they may show four they may show eight um you don't see huge numbers, you know, eight or nine animals is probably a large entry to someone in the Netherlands, uh, but they're able to show in those four classes and, and everything is structured around um, the best animal, you know, scoring the most points uh, for that particular breed that, you know, they also will give some awards for the, the best, uh, the male and the best female in some cases. But the overall, it's, you know, it's the animal and the breed that, that scored the most. The other thing that is unique um, in Europe and, and at the shows is, for example, here we show some of our breeds in color groups. Lops, for example. You know, when you go judge Holland Lops and Holland Lops solid senior buck class, you may have, you know, eight, 10 different colors in that class. Over there, each one of those colors is broken out separately. So black senior bucks are judged together, black senior does, uh, black young bucks, black young does, all those are separate. And then they will pick an award for the best black you know, dwarf lop or whatever. You don't see any grouping of colors in Europe in any of the countries. Then when you go to Germany, the system of judging there focuses on uh, two things, actually three things. It focuses on the breeder who brings the best collection of four animals, uh, and those get a, a huge award or prize for the show. You know, those are your master breeders. Those are the ones that, that you know, come away... Um, with uh, a lot of uh, recognition from a show. And then they focus on the highest scoring buck and the highest scoring doe in each breed color. So again, uh, if you look at dwarfs, there is going to be a, a, a master in each dwarf color. There's going to be a champion buck in each dwarf color, and there's going to be a champion doe in each dwarf color. They never put those together and say, okay, what is the best dwarf? That's not done like we do it. So really? every one of those breeds colors has a champion breeder, a champion buck and a champion doe. And they only show adults in Germany. The only time you see young animals shown is uh, the end of summer, beginning of fall. They have these more relaxed fun shows, which they call young animal shows. And so the breeders are bringing these animals that they have just produced, you know, during the winter, early spring, and they get an assessment on them, uh, but it's not a, a strong competition show. Once the big shows start, and they focus all their shows around the, the best uh, environmental time for rabbits. You know, when are your rabbits are gonna be in the best shape with fur and condition? Well, it's in your colder months. So they will start their shows in the fall. Um, October is typically the earliest you see a show in, in continental Europe. And then, of course, the bigger shows are starting in November. And then typically the national shows, like in Germany, will be in December. Um, and then in Holland, you'll see it uh, in January. Uh, and again, in Belgium and France in January, February. So it, they, they wait to have their shows 
when their animals are going to be at their optimum prime condition. So they would never have, for example, here, you know, we have them early October, October when, you know, if you live in the South, you, you don't have a coat finished then. Uh, so they would never have a national show uh, at a time when, when most rabbits would not be ready. But um, so in Germany, you know, a breeder will take a collection of four rabbits or typically a collection of eight rabbits. That's, that's normally the most. And most breeders only breed one color. Um, some breed two, but not often. And typically they breed one breed. Some might breed two, but you don't see a lot of breeders breeding multiple breeds or multiple colors. Why is that? Uh, it's it's because they're 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 concentrating on quality. I mean, the whole system over there is is about quality, not quantity. They recognize nothing. I mean, there's no awards, there's no point systems for having a lot of anything. So it's all about who is the top as far as quality, judging points, that sort of thing. So they say, oh, you know, it only takes four. It only takes one. And so that's what they concentrate on because a person can have a rabbitry. For example, one of the best black dwarf breeders in the Netherlands, he can, he only has 30, 30 cages. That's maximum. That's young. That's breeding. That's herd bucks. That's everything. And year after year, he produces some of the top black dwarfs in the country. And, you know, and that's a good example. You, it, it, you don't have to have a, a hundred whole cage, you know, but he's, he's very critical, you know, in his culling. He's very strategic in his breeding. If something's not right, it goes. Um, there's a low tolerance level. And again, things are expensive over there. You know, you got to think about uh, petrol, gas, diesel, benzene, whatever you want to call it over there, uh, seven something a gallon at the moment. So you think about what it costs to go to a show, you know, just just in fuel. <clears throat> Do you, I mean, I, I know this answer for Bradford, I mean, seeing it there firsthand and the, the, the National Tour of England, but is it also true in, in continental Europe? Breeders only bring out rabbits that are 100% prime and ready to have a chance at doing well at the show. So, I mean, that's, that. In theory, that's true, but you will occasionally see because you have levels of breeders, you know, in continental Europe, too. So you have people who are just beginning and, you know, they may not bring a rabbit that's totally finished, uh, but that rabbit is going to be phenomenal in every other quality. You know what I mean? Uh, type, head, ears, that sort of thing. Uh, they're going to be super, even though maybe it wasn't quite finished. But for the most part, the rabbits that you see um, on the shows in continental Europe are in what I would call optimum show condition. I feel though there is a difference though between um, the number of rabbits that people want to bring out and the, the, they only bring out the ones that are prime versus, uh, you know, hey, we're going to show, we're going to bring, we're going to bring 10 this weekend, you know, and it doesn't matter that they're at piano, it doesn't matter if they, they're crazy bulls and, and uh, it's just a different, at least at Bradford, I know it was a different philosophy of, of uh, seeing people go, hey, I only want to bring out the best. Yeah, I entered that one. It's out of coat now. It's molting. I decided to leave that one home. I, don't, I know it doesn't have a chance. Right. Yeah. Same philosophy there on continental Europe. Because, again, those show cards are posted, you know, above the rabbit. And they don't want to see, you know, a rabbit with their association with a score of 92 or 90 points or 89 points, you know, it's a, it's, it's, again, it's a matter of pride type thing and uh, kind of an embarrassment. So, uh, you know, if that rabbit's not going to score, you know, 95 and a half, 96 or above, they really don't want it there for people to see. They'll leave it at home. We're here, you know, rabbit can be just, you know, fur coming flying and that sort of thing and the person's like yeah it's in a little bit of a molt you know and no big deal so yeah you would never see that there never I i've told some of my friends in europe i said you need to come and see at least one of our american shows at one point uh to see the vast difference in how rabbits come to a show um because it's they would be yeah, it's, 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 just, it's just different um 
the uh and toenails david i'll interrupt you one other thing you know here as a judge you often see these animals when you turn them over toenails that need to be trimmed you know for weeks or months that sort of thing uh when they come to a show over there toenails must be trimmed and if they're not it's a point deduction and when you take off a whole point from a score that automatically basically eliminates that rabbit from winning any an award at that show because one point added to all the other deductions that that rabbit will get you know however many uh knocks it down enough that it can't do well so uh grooming uh animal white rabbits are white on their paws under their tail on their bellies you know uh every animal the 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 breeder takes us a concentrated effort to bring it in what we would call tip-top show shape you know and nails that's that's just unforgivable if you bring an animal there to a show with its nails not trimmed because it's going to be a deduction and, and you can't win um i wish you know there was that conscientious here sometimes because you know you see nails coming that 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 are in really bad shape sometimes in the, in the reality is too the, the when the nails are in that bad shape the rabbit's not in its prime it's not moving around as well it's not eating as well it's not it's not there's a lot of things that are going on that the coat's not in great shape and it's it's not as healthy as it so I mean, there's additional things that not just from the initial look of those nails but all those other things that go with it so oh, yeah absolutely. It's, it's incredible to see on a on a white rabbit or any of their color of animals that you know there's no urine on the feet. The feet are the exact color they're supposed to be. It's absolutely stunning when you see the rabbit go, wow, like wow, that one that's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> right. And, and then you think this rabbit's not being kept on wire. It's being kept on a solid floor, you know, and it's coming to a show over there with these, you know, spotless white feet you know and clean bellies and, and we have people sometimes here keeping them on wire and they go i just can't keep it clean you know and you're like okay yeah it, it's once you see it you really have an appreciation for just how incredibly stunning they are uh but but that but that goes back to the point like they they are only taking those best ones and they're taking so much care on those animals uh versus just pumping numbers and, and having uh not the same emphasis on, on uh, hygiene clinics. Oh, absolutely. And I think they spend a, a, a significant amount of time in their rabbitries with their individual rabbits, you know. So clipping nails is just something they do, you know, not just because it's going to a show, but something they do just because they're handling their rabbits, you know, on a pretty regular basis to prepare them, you know, to be ready for a show. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to go back to the, one of the topics here just briefly. You, uh, you had said like that on black non dwarfs that they would have just in that class that they wouldn't compete on anything higher than that. You'd have the master of that, uh, variety and, and the best of, is it best of variety? So they, they just call it, they treat, uh, they almost treat those varieties of dwarfs as, as breeds. I mean, you know, it's the, uh, even though the breed has a name and the variety has a name, you just have the best one of those and the best group and, and you have the best male and female, they separate that. So you have three big awards and then they give smaller awards, you know, for example, you may have two bucks that score 97 and a half points. And it's based on how many points they got in what positions, because the positions from the top down uh, carry more weight than others so if you've got one scoring 20 points in say position two and the other one scored 19 there okay position two is a is a is a more um desirable position then that's how that rabbit you know which one is first and which one is second even though they both have 97 and a half points uh and so there are some lesser awards then this other rabbit who has an equal score gets so you know but the the coveted awards are that the one where the the breeder has the group of four with the highest points and then the top scoring buck and doe and and they never at the german shows there is no no uh, best in show so you never see all these rabbits from all these breeds or varieties coming up and competing against each other. There's no such thing as a best in show. Now you may say, okay, this is the best animal in the show because this is the only rabbit that got a 98 because 98, you know, it's a seldom given score unless it's a super animal 
or even a 98.5, you know, but that rabbit didn't compete and judges didn't look at it and compare it to say this is best in show. That doesn't happen. In the Netherlands, um, that does happen. They bring the animals up together at the end and they do look at them and uh, they have a, a judging panel of typically three to five judges who will look at them and uh, and rate rate them uh, comparing them against each other. And there they have cards. So for example, the cards begin at a 10. So you, you hold up a 10 card for the animal you believe out of that group is your best animal. And so after you may have six animals and they do this in a, in a process. So you start with a group and it's group after group after group till you get to the final selection of maybe five or six animals that are being looked at. And so after all the judges have looked at them, there's no discussion. So you don't discuss it and you've got your cards. Um, and at the end, you know, they they will identify, OK, uh, the silver and everybody holds up their card at the same time for the silver. You know, ideally, you would like everybody to be, you know, uh, coordinated and, and within a point of each other. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes, you know, these three have tens. This one has a nine for the silver. And here's somebody with a, a six card, you know, but he saw something or didn't see something. Uh, and but they add up those points and that animal becomes the best animal of the show. So they do pick a best in show in that process in the Netherlands. Do they then do they only get to give out one ten and one nine, one eight, one seven? Or can I keep giving out tens? Uh, As a so you can only give it out once. So for that group. So every group you can give it out once. You can give each number out once. So you've got to figure out, you know, in your head, okay, of these six animals, that one's getting the 10, this gets nine, this eight, this seven, and whatever. And so as they call them out, you're ready to hold up your card. It's a little intense, you know, the, the Day of the Dwarf show, big international show over there is coming up in two weeks. I'll go over and judge. And at the end, I've been on that panel in the end. And it's really intense because, you know, as a judge, you don't want to look like a fool. You know, here you are with the six card and everybody else is holding the 10 card. You know, that's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so it's you're really looking at the animals to say, OK, based on the standard, how do these line up? And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it happens sometimes, even with judges that are from there, you know, European judges, they don't always agree and you'll see some discrepancy, but sometimes you'll see 10, 10, 10, 10, you know, and it's normally a phenomenal animal and it's, you couldn't miss it. So when, like when we see those photos of seven judges at the end, or seven judges with a, like all looking at one rabbit, that's what they're actually looking at us for best in show. It's not out of their having seven people judge the one rabbit throughout the show. Right. They're either looking for, they're looking either for the best of that group, which whose winner will go up and compete in a final group for best in show, or they're looking at the best in show. Cause not always are the group judges the same as the final judges, for example. So you may have a panel of, uh, of three different sets of five, in the whole process that look along the way and then you get a whole new set for best in show hmm. seldom do the the same judges look at all the groups that lead up to best in show hmm. that's interesting yeah, uh, yeah it, it, that does make a difference though i mean if, if uh that it makes it that much more it makes everybody right around on the same playing field that everyone has to be that much better to keep getting to the next level. It's not just, Hey, that's my style. I picked it and then it's going to the next thing. And then it like, it's a lot easier path sometimes. Oh, exactly. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, uh, especially like at the, the day of the dwarf show, you have an international judging panel. They are judging at the show. So the final best in show team may be three judges from three different countries. Uh, for a lot of years, it was, uh, myself, a German judge, and a Dutch judge. You know, it was the three of us picking the best in show from the animals that we had been sent up from previous mm -hmm. teams of judges selecting them. So we had, unless we had actually judged the rabbit, we, we weren't familiar with any of the rabbits, you know, that we were going to look at for best in show. So it's not like, okay, I'm going to pick one of the rabbits that I, I judged or, you know, I know this rabbit. In, in, in a couple of years, um, it was interesting 
I was not on the final best in show judging team, but a rabbit that I had judged ended up best in show, which is nice, you know, because it, it had to get through me as a judge first to get up there in the group. And then it made it through the group and then made it to the best in show. Um, and one was a Harlequin dwarf, which was amazing. Yeah, that's definitely much. Uh, uh, it's one of the rare. I mean, that that would be a rare type of color. Yeah, not suspecting. You know, it was a it was a very nice uh, representative for a, a harlequin dwarf. Is there like in, in the countries where they do the point system? Is there much discrepancy uh, in the points? Like, I mean, is 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 one judge giving it ninety six and the next one giving it? 95 so it's essentially equal or does one of them get a 96 one give them a 92 and like people are like oh my gosh like yeah that's the amazing thing not normally um typically at multiple judgings you might see a half point difference and it's uh, interesting when you go visit breeders homes and you look at rabbits and they're talking about you know i've shown this particular animal four times or five times and that's the other thing breeders collect their cards I mean, these judging cards have value to the breeders. So they take them home, you know, they file them, they keep them. So when you talk about an animal, they can go to a file and pull out five cards for that animal that year. And it's amazing when you lay out those cards like you would lay out, you know, cards from a deck, the scores are either the same or they vary like a half a point. And if they do vary, Oftentimes it's something like, okay, the fur wasn't quite finished here. So it got knocked down, you know, a half a point. Now we're four shows down and the rabbit has had time to finish and, and it has gained that half point. It's phenomenal. But every once in a while you will see, you know, the rabbit scored uh, 96 and a half points on the first judging. They don't, that's the other thing. Normally their shows over there are single shows. Rabbits are judged one time. That's it. You know, there are no doubles and triples. Unique shows like the Day of the Dwarf, where you have different countries coming together and you have different types of shows. Rabbits are judged multiple times that day, but that's an exception. 99.9% uh, .9 of the shows is the rabbits come in, they're judged by one judge, one time, that's it. You know, over a, a three or four day period or even a two day period. Um, but you will see, for example, you know, 96.5 here. And then on the next show, maybe a judge found something, you know, uh, that they questioned. And the other judge, you know, uh, didn't see, you know, mistakes happen. We're human, for example. You know, they missed a, a white spot somewhere. But I'll tell you that the judges training over there in all the countries is so strict. I think that has made for uniformity because they're all basically on the same uh, same thinking system, you know, training system, um, and it's a slow process. Um, the, the folks in the Netherlands say uh, you can become a surgeon for people quicker than you can become an all-breed licensed judge. And it's almost like, that. I mean, 15, 16 years, some of them, to go, and they have levels. You know, they start out as a C judge, and so they only have a certain number of breeds. And then they go up to a B judge and they've got more breeds. And it's only when you get to become an A judge and get all those breeds uh, that you can, you know, that you're one of the top, top level judges. But it does. It's phenomenal how long it takes. Wow. Well, that's, you were saying like the it's C dedication. breeds are the ones. That, you know, yeah, a lot of dedication to these people. You're saying those C breeds were the ones that were more vanilla, that it was just easy. It was the simpler type of, of breeds. Right. It's yeah. fascinating. So then um, let's go into that a little deeper. The uh, So their process, somebody starts, like how, how, do, how do they work through it? Yeah, so uh, it's, um, first of all, you have to be a breeder of quality rabbits. And you have to be known for breeding quality rabbits. So if you're not breeding and you're not showing animals that are doing well, don't apply because something's wrong. You know, you're keeping rabbits, but you're not successful. So why would we want you to be a judge? You know, either you, you don't have the skills, you don't have the eye, you don't have something because nobody breeds rabbits that are continually, you know, low level or poor quality. 
You know, everybody wants to breed nice rabbits and they work toward that. So that's the first step. You have to be a breeder of quality animals. And then you start, because these are coop shows, um, they all have people bringing rabbits one at a time to the judge. You know, they're helpers, they're carriers, so to speak. And you start out caring for a judge. And the purpose for caring is so that you can learn, you know, not right there in the judging process, but by observing, you know, how does this judge handle the rabbits? What is he saying? What is he looking for? And so you do that for a period of time. Uh, and in Germany, there's actually a test associated with that helper process that you have to have a test to, to get past the, the helper piece, you know, in other countries, it's not. Uh, and once you've done the helping piece for a couple years, then you go up to being an assistant judge. So you're there, you know, you're part of writing the cards, you're part of examining the rabbit, working with the judge for a, a period of time, a couple years normally. And then after that, in all the exams, then you're able to actually become uh, in a, a, a first level judge in most countries. Germany is the only place that does not have level judges, but, but they have this really rigorous process to get to even take the judge's exam. Everybody else has a leveled process where you start with a small number of breeds and you just add breeds every year until you finally have, have tested on. And the other thing is, if you're in a country that is adding new breeds, that means you know, you're going to have to take exams for those new breeds at the end, too, before you're in, uh, licensed or approved to judge all of them. So you can you can start the process with 50 breeds. But by the time you end it, it might be 65, you know, because it's growing periodically or new colors and things. And, for example, this North Show in Holland, they give a lot of judges exams there and they have teams of of. The judges who give the exams and the judges who are your senior level judges are people who have been breeding rabbits typically for a long period of time. You know, they've been successful. You seldom would see a judge whose license is five or six or seven years in a position, you know, of giving an exam or things of that nature. Uh, it's just oriented toward experience more so. Uh, but um, they, you know, they're very rigorous with these exams. They'll go, uh, because it is a show, they have access to all these animals at the show. So they can go pull a rabbit that has a unique disqualification and bring it up to the applicant and say, okay, judge this rabbit. They know, you know, this team of examining judges know what this rabbit has, but you as an applicant have no idea. And hopefully you will find it, you know, and, and describe it. Or they may pull the champion giant and bring it up and say evaluate it and you give it a 92 you know that, that's that doesn't fly i felt really sorry for one guy i observed um taking his exam and he was adding belgian hares this year you could tell he hadn't had time to work with any breeder he didn't breed the breed and you know from judging hares they all don't perform the way you'd want them to when you want them to and you have to know kind of okay i lift here or i do this he had no knowledge of that. And I felt really sorry there, you know, watching him trying to, to make this hair, you know, pose like a hair should pose. So he, for him to evaluate it um, and he didn't pass his exam. I mean, it was just that simple. Um, but also with the judging process, we're here, you know, if we see a rabbit, we want to disqualify, we disqualify it. Or if we see a rabbit, we want to make best in show and we're the best in show judge. We do it over there. Uh, to, to disqualify a rabbit, you have to go to what would be a supervising judge. And that judge has to agree with you. Yes, this is a disqualification. And not only do they have to agree, they have to sign the judging card and stamp it with their stamp to show that, yes, this is a disqualification. Same way, if you want to elevate a rabbit above 96 and a half points, you have to go to a supervising judge or panel of judges who look at the rabbit and say, yes, it can be elevated to a 97 or 97 and a 0.5. Um, and in Belgium, again, 97 is high. If you're in uh, the highest score, if you're in Germany, it can go up. So the supervising judge can okay the 97 or 97.5. But then if you say, and the supervisor agrees, you know, this is really a 98, 98.5 rabbit over in Germany, 
Then you go to the panel that's made up of three judges there, and they will look at it and tell you yes or no, this animal is, is truly a 98 or 98.5. So there's multi levels of uh, agreement on top quality animals that you go through it in some of the countries. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's just a totally different process than what we're used to in terms of how the show flows. Interesting. Sure. Yeah. Do, do so you, when you're saying that on the training, it's more practical and hands on, or is it, uh, or, or I mean, is it still a lot of, tested? yeah, a lot of theory too. So, I mean, you have to know, you know, how the standards worded, how many points are for weight, uh, how is the color described, that sort of thing. And again, it's the beginning exams. Okay. They give you genetic questions. You know, okay, you're going to breed a rabbit that has this gene sequence with a rabbit with this gene sequence. What should you expect? And, you know, off the top of your head, you have to go, okay, well, these genes do this and these do this and 25% will be this and 50% will be that type thing. Um, That's and, and the amount of that varies from country to country. The the reality is though, as, as judges even here in the U.S., I mean, we do have people that ask us for advice, and we do have people that ask us, or something happens, and and you need to have some general understanding of, you know, nutrition, or hey, this uh, <clears throat> Polish is going to eat a lot less than uh, than a Flemish giant, or yeah. or, uh, or or less than Dutch, and um, just kind of ha having some initial discussions. I mean, is still critical. I think even here, right? Um, so, I, but we don't. We definitely don't require judges in the u.s of that other type of knowledge of how's this color going to breed with this one what's it going to mean or if you breed a salad and broken what does it mean i mean i think that most of us know it but it's not something that's required to get the license yeah and even on our written test you know uh we have maybe one or two questions that are taken from a particular breed over there you have you know a, a written exam per breed so you may have 30 or 40 or 50 written questions just for each breed. And then you have your practical for each breed and you have your oral for each breed. So it's a lengthy process, you know, where you say, okay, I can afford to miss two questions on a Rhinelander because that's probably as most, as you would see, you know, on an all breed judges exam over there. Okay. You're going to have 40 questions on the Rhinelander. So you really have to know it. Uh, and, 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 and the applicants really stress. I mean, I've been with them the night before their exam, you know, uh, and this time uh, two breeders came up to me who are um, C-class judges and were adding breeds to their list. Uh, they were adding the Turinger, which we would know as a cinnamon here. And they were adding the Salander, which is the, uh, the cinnamon, but has the, the light body with the gray sides. And they come up to me and they said, okay, we got exams tomorrow. Will you go over here and walk through, you know, the tour ringers and the salanders with us and help us understand proper color. So, you know, I took, you know, 45 minutes and went with those two judges over there and went through, you know, okay, because they knew some of those animals were going to be selected by the judging panel and brought before them, you know, the next day, and they're going to have to make remarks. So we went through them, you know, okay, this one has proper body color down the back. This one doesn't have enough, you know, shading on the side. This one here is too dark on the head because the, over there, for example, American Sables, they have a breed, they just call them Sables, where we call them American Sables. But one of the requirements for a, a properly colored American Sable or Sable, or and they also have it in the Duluth, the Smoke Pearl, you must have a cross on the forehead. It must come. You must see this cross that begins here at the ear and it comes down here and then it goes across at the cap of the ear. And that comes with a properly colored sable. And I've never heard that over here. No one's ever mentioned it. But the first that was one of the first things I learned with sables over there is like, OK, when you're looking the head, you must see the cross here on the top at the at the ear base. And sure enough, uh, you know, I take pictures now with some of them and you can see it. It's right there on properly colored sables. Um, so it's interesting things, you know, 
being able to go over there and work with them, uh, it, it really enlightens, you know, your knowledge base, especially of color and breeds. And, mm -hmm. and I think they pay more attention to specific traits of a breed only because they have been, um, I guess, tested. You know, they've been expected to know these little bitty things. So when you put a rabbit up there, you know, we probably see more holistically, uh, but little finite things don't necessarily with each breed come forward. Where for them, it's like immediately, you know, they're pointing out these little bitty things, which is a half point deduction, you know, in some cases. Because we often hear, well, you know, it's only worth uh, five points. But when you think about it, okay, if it's only worth five points and it's not good, so you're going to take away a point or two. So now you're down, you know, automatically, you know, when you do that over there, that rabbit could never be successful, you know, taking away a point or two for something. And you're saying on a category that's five points that it, that it, we, we, we would look at our standard and go, eh, it's, it's five points on this breed. Eh, doesn't matter that much. And yeah, exactly. You know, like uh, you're, you're saying those points matter for, for it to do well. It's interesting. Yeah. Cause because you think about, okay, five points, well, automatically now you're down to a 95-point rabbit. Mm -hmm. I mean, not right. many champions are 95-point rabbits, really. So Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. Do the uh, – yeah, yeah, versus the way that we, we view it over here of, of – hey, that's just – it's yeah, it's something that we have points on in the breed, but it's not as uh, impactful uh, right. <clears throat> as, as the other category. And I think that's probably why it's led to some things like, you know, if we look at our Holland Lop, which they call dwarf lops, the fur on them, what has happened over the years, you know, uh, and dwarfs too. Even though we have 15 points on dwarfs fur, the fur has become extremely long, you know, on, on, on the breed. And Hollands too, you see this long fur. Part of it is because, you know, okay, it's not as many points as say, you know, the head or the type or something. And eventually these things that we kind of put in a perception – it's not many points, you know, uh, it, it goes down the wrong trail. And, and once it goes so far, you know, we can't turn it, turn it around. Uh, and I think it's that kind of look, but where you say, oh, yeah, it's five points, but now we have a 95 point rabbit before we look at anything else, you know, mm -hmm. any of its other flaws, we, we all mm -hmm. you know 95 if it's, if it's really bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it, yeah, it, it totally, it totally makes sense. How how uh, how many breeds are there over like in the, in the other countries? Oh, it depends. I mean, in some of the uh, Eastern European countries, I mean, they have mm, 70, 80 plus breeds because a lot of those countries have country breeds in addition, you know, to their own breeds. So uh, they have probably, I would say uh, there are almost twice as many breeds over there as opposed to what we have. Do not in all uh, countries are they recognized, of course, but when you look at as a whole all the different breeds that are recognized in somebody's standard, I would yeah, say you know, almost double what we have. Do, do <clears throat> like I know the ARBA standard, you have to buy the book uh, or download the app. I know in England or for the BRC or British Rabbit Council, uh, their standard is widely available, anybody can go download it download it even right now the link will be at the bottom right. um download the, their standard and you can see a lot of their the photos of their breeds um are the breeds and or are like the breeds in continental europe is there something like an easy resource where you can just go in and look at them so most of the countries have some sort of resource where you can find their standard online or standards of individual breeds online uh, the Netherlands just opened up their standard. You know, they just converted to all digital, uh, their association. And, you know, anybody who goes to the website, there's their standard. You can get it, color picture, you know, where the BRC gives you the written form, but they don't give you all the nice pictures that go with the breed. Uh, the Dutch have decided, nope, we're going to put it digital. We're going to let anybody who wants it, they can go look it up, download it, and we're going to update it with the new breeds and additions as they come out. In Germany, um individuals are allowed to post standards so it's not like oh you know here we wouldn't dare you know copy the arba standard and put it up on our website or our facebook or something from fear of you know the copyright police saying no that's not allowed over there it's fine so you go to breeder pages and they'll say you know i raised german giants 
and here is the you know the german association standard for it uh in france same way you can go to the french association you can go they have their breeds broken out and you can see standards uh so they are and the goal there and their philosophy is that you know we want people to breed rabbits to quality but typically and again it goes back they're breeding a breed or a color within a breed you know and so that why do they need a book you know to do that we don't want them to have to go and buy you know our 30 euro 40 euro 50 euro book just so they can focus on two pages so we make this information readily available to them they can go and download it and they've got it then to use for breeding their rabbits it's all about uh publicity i think and, and creating a culture of of quality you know hey we want them to breed to a standard we're going to make it available to them if they want to become a judge then okay or if they want to breed multiple breeds and learn fine they can buy it but most people do not you know buy a standard book over there because the information is available unless they're going to be a judge or a, a show official or something you know but their standards are great i mean i'm i'm just amazed um I want to show you one. Um, this is uh, the standard that came, uh, you can see it from Serbia mm -hmm. or Croatia, yeah. sorry. But in here, because color is important, so where things should have particular ring color in oh, their wow. factors, they actually made it so that you can see the rings of the color in the breed as well as the overall surface color. So the, the guy who put this together is a, a phenomenal person uh, over there, and he spent a lot of time doing it. But they they tried to do that for each of their breeds, put that 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 picture showing ring color, under color, so the judges, the breeders, whoever, would be able to see that, you know. And they did that. Um, uh, let's see if I can find another one real quick. That's so, super impressive. <clears throat> I mean, we would take two photos and put you know, that in you there. You can see there. Um, <laughs> So they've got two different places, you know, on that rabbit where they've blown into it so that you can see it. So a lot of time and effort, you know, went into these pictures. Uh, the guy puts out phenomenal, phenomenal type. Wow, those are really neat. Getting to see those photos of the animals posed and then uh, also having that ring color or the color, the surface color and blowing in to see the undercoat. But education, that's a, that's a big importance over there in all the countries is education. You know, um, there's a magazine that comes out in Germany every month. You know, they have their German magazine and it's focused on um, shows. So you see the results of all the shows, uh, but it's also focused on educational. I mean, they get really detailed information like this is all about different eye diseases you know, with very specific pictures and written by veterinarians and technical things for breeders, uh, food things, genetic things, all of that's covered uh, with great pictures in it. It's, you know, it's about a hundred pages and they publish it once a month. Um, and, and they, once a month. And they focus every month and like, this is the cover of it. So every month there will be a breed that they focus on and they go detail. So they'll talk about the ear shape, the color, the type, the stand, the toenails, the fur, everything about that breed in detail. And they do that every month. Uh, it's just just amazing. Uh, same thing with food stuffs, you know, feeding and this, that and the other. An interesting thing I think uh, you'll find very unique in Germany. Um, they and first of all, in most of continental Europe, you know, in the UK, uh, for rabbits to be shown, they ban them unless it's an imported rabbit and they'll come in with a tattoo. Continental Europe uses basically uh, tattoos for the rabbits. And people can't tattoo their own rabbits like they can here. So you have to have an official from a club actually come out and tattoo your rabbit uh, when the young are with its mother because they want to see and they make a record showing the mother, the father, the babies, you know, how many they are, the sex, the tattoo numbers. And again, in most countries in continental Europe, that tattoo is associated with some sort of information connected to the, when that rabbit's born. So you can actually look at the tattoo and know this rabbit was born on this month of this year. 
So there's no question, is this a senior? You know, is it six months old? Is it a year old? You know, simply by looking at the ear. That's not always the same in all the European countries, but many of them. Um, and, and so you have that tattoo system, you know, going on. Well, that tattoo system in Germany then goes into this huge database. So they run reports and they publish these reports in this magazine and online. And they can tell you how many breeders are breeding each variety of each breed every year. They can tell you how many breeding animals exist out there amongst the breeders. They can tell you how many animals were produced in each variety of each breed that year. That detailed, and they, ha they keep it. So they can give you a six, a 10 or 12 year comparison to show, okay, in this breed, you know, we had this many breeders uh, five years ago. Now we have this many breeders. There was this many animals in a breeding program. There was this many animals produced. Phenomenal data that they keep per breed, per color. Uh, it's just amazing to see the charts. Yeah, that's, that's over here. Amazing. I mean, if I ask you how many New Zealand white breeders there are in the United States, we don't know. No, no we I do. Find it if we wanted to, you know. No, I do. Yeah. You can send an email to the German Association. Hey, how many New Zealand white breeders are there currently? Oh, there's so many. And there was this many New Zealands produced last year. And the other thing is, rabbits only get a tattoo if they're quality. So if a, re a, a rabbit is not quality, it doesn't get a tattoo, which means it can't be shown. So they eliminate some of this lesser quality to begin with because it's never tattooed. So in in England or in the UK, they do the, the leg bands. Uh, in, in continental Europe, though, those countries are tattooing them? They tattoo either one or two ears, depending on the country. Interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting that they'd have a club member come out and, and tattoo them and such. I mean, uh, it's just a different style than what we have here. I mean, we have we have uh, tattoo them whatever you want, write sentences in the air, <laughs> use a pen, right. use a clamp. I mean, so they're still using. The, I mean, they're mainly still using the clamp uh, tattooer then as well. Totally, every animal is clamped that's tattooed. There are no hand tattoo things. You know, electric systems used. Um, Typically, the right ear, for the countries who tattoo both ears, the right ear typically has some information that tells you something about the breeder, the breeder's location. Uh, and it may or may not tell you uh, gear type information. The left ear typically tells you information about the month. Uh, in Germany, for example, if you look at a, a rabbit, uh, it's left ear. Uh, the first digit is going to be the month it was born. The second digit is going to be the year it was born. And the numbers that come after that is simply which rabbit that was in that breed, in that color, in that club, that local club that was tattooed that month of that year. So, for example, if a rabbit's got a, a 4, 2, 10, then you know it was born April of 2022. And it was the 10th rabbit of that color in that breed in that local club that was tattooed. And that goes into the record book. So that's how they're able to pull all this data and statistics to say, we have this many breeders and they produce this many rabbits and they're breeding from this many animals. Do, do they then also, I mean, is there any tracking of the actual, like, like do they keep the pedigrees up at all or anything like that? So they do have... Uh, in Germany, you can buy from the, the association, which is really neat, a, a, a pedigree type program. They sell one. You can buy it and download it and use it. Some breeders keep and they believe in these pedigrees and they will keep multi-generation pedigrees. Uh, for other breeders, keeping pedigrees is not something that's important. And, you know, they know in their head, sort of, you know, these lines and that sort of thing. But they don't necessarily produce pedigrees on rabbits. So it varies okay. you know, from breeder to breeder and also from country to country. I mean, um, some of the Eastern European countries give you, you know, very detailed. They in terms of what line that came from, uh, what was the highest points that rabbit scored, you know, that sort of thing. Very detailed oriented pedigrees. That's, a, that's very interesting. So that, that's why sometimes when we get the, 
rabbits that come in from other countries that on a pedigree, that's why somebody just writes in for it because it literally there wasn't a pedigree that came with it. Right. And, and, and some of that is just because someone didn't ask. I got you. I mean, they just said, oh, they don't use pedigrees, you know, it's import and they don't ask. But a lot and, and that may be the case for some breeders. But a lot of times, you know, if somebody wants a pedigree, I'll like, yeah, I'll ask the breeder and they'll send, you know, it may not be a full three generation pedigree or it may be, you know, a five generation pedigree. It just depends on the, on the person in the system. I see. But it's it's interesting that like having the points be on there for the highest point that I have scored. I mean, that's their way of identifying the its quality and stuff. So that, that is really right. cool. the, the reason why I was asking was, I mean, I am wine reading is definitely done heavily within our industry. <laughs> Usually the top breeders, that's what they're doing is, is some form of line breeding. Um, one of the things I thought found fascinating, and it's somebody that I'm gonna bring on here at some point is uh, in the goat industry, he showed me how their national system, you just, hey, I want a BX43, that's an amazing animal. And um, I wanna know what animals are out of him or like either sons and daughters or grandchildren out of him. I wanna go find one of them. And you can just type in that you know, tattoo or the name of that animal and it pops up and then that gives you your, uh, you know, your source of where you can get your gene pool from. It's just, it was a, it's a different way of what, uh, you know, we have today. So, and then it will show like the percentage of line breeding and such. So, Yeah, there's a new company in Germany um, that's producing a new program over there that's being used now by a lot of breeders in Germany. It's a, it's a multifunctional program. It started out as just a sort of like of a pedigree program. Uh, but now they have integrated in it all of the uh, tracking system for vaccinations, that sort of thing, where it gives you, you know, when it was vaccinated, what it was vaccinated for. Uh, it, they've integrated in the show results. So you put your show results in there. Um, the overall goal is that it connects to anything that is in that system. So, you know, if because things are controlled, you know, with tattoos and whatnot, that you could trace a rabbit literally multi-generations if those breeders are all using the system. But also they're looking at connecting that system with the show system over there. So if you're wanting to go to a show, you pull up your animals in your system there and you say, okay, click, click, click. I'm showing this group of eight and you hit the button and that's instantaneously transmitted to the show done. And, you know, there's no typing, there's no looking, there's no nothing. It knows the sex, it knows the age, it knows the color of the breed, everything. And it automatically, um, which is pretty neat. Hmm. Yeah, that is, that is, that is really neat. It, it, they also uh, has an option, which some of them have been using to print a little show tag so that you can hang that tag on your um, show coop. For example, you're putting the rabbit up for sale. The selling of rabbits in Europe is at shows is, is totally different too, uh, which you may know. Um, individuals don't sell rabbits. I mean, you don't go in, you don't go and find a breeder and say, hey, what do you have for sale? You go um, and every show, uh, they produce like a catalog. This is like the big catalog here. You can see how thick it is for the German national show. But even the small shows, for example, um, Like this is a small catalog. So this is a little local show. Soon as the, the judging's done, they put together these catalogs and inside is the information, you know, uh, every breeder that showed is there, their name, their address, the rabbits they showed, what the point scores are. And if the rabbits are, are for sale, then over here in a, in a column, like right there, is the price that that rabbit's for sale. And all the sales are coordinated through the show office. So typically on Saturday morning, if you're going, if you're wanting to buy rabbits, you get there very early. So most shows open, you know, seven, seven thirty, eight o'clock. You get there at like five o'clock in the morning because you want to be the first in the door so that number one, you can buy your catalog. You can look in the catalog to see what's for sale. Some breeders never look at the rabbit. They simply look at the catalog really quickly. Okay, I know this breeder here. Yep, that's the breeder I want rabbits from. He had these three for sale. This is the top scoring one. And you literally run to the cash office and you say, I want to buy Coop 500. And they type in on the computer and they go, yep, okay, 
500 is for sale. That's uh, 75 euros. Do you want it? And you say, yes. And they say, okay, we add 15% to that. That goes to the club. That's their way of making, you know, money and sustaining. And so they add that 15% to the 75 euros. You pay them, you get a slip of paper. Uh, and it varies from country to country. Some countries, um, you get a slip of paper and you tear it in half. You keep half and you put the other half in the cage. And others, they just give you a little card. And then they go back and they'll put a sold ticket, you know, on that rabbit's coop. So other people that see it aren't going to run there. Um, and so that's the way rabbits are, are, are bought and sold. You take your slip. Uh, you get your rabbit, you put it in a box, you go to a door, they have security there, they take the rabbit out, they look at the two tattoos or one tattoo, depending, they look at your sales slip, they say, yep, and you go out the door with it. And people by the busloads come to these shows and line up to go in and buy animals from all over Europe. I mean, you have, for example, the German National Show uh, that was that just a couple of weeks ago. You had buses from Italy, you know, buses from uh, all these other European countries. And they're all lined up outside. It's amazing to walk outside and just see bus after bus after bus. And they come there for the day. They enjoy the show. They buy the rabbit. They put it in the box. And again, you know, we go to shows and we see people over here in America. Oh, we're buying five, six, seven rabbits. No, they're going there to buy one really exceptional rabbit put it in their box and put it under the bus and go home. And, and, and they've had a great day. You know, the other thing that's interesting about the shows is uh, alcohol. Alcohol is typical at shows, you know, it's in the showroom. You, you can have coffee, you can have soft drink, but you can also have you a glass of wine or a beer and, you know, people celebrate and talk and that sort of thing. And it's just as, as normal as, we would see, you know, uh, a coffee stand at a show here. Uh, you don't see anybody uh, inebriated or drunk, you know. They, they celebrate wins. Everybody's happy. That's the other thing, you know. Even though me and you are stark competitors in our breed, at the end of the day when the judging, we're joking, we're laughing, we're looking at each other's rabbits. Yeah, okay. I suppose, you know, you had the best one, but I really think over here, mine was just a little better here. And then we turn around, we go have something to eat and something to drink. And, you know, all our buddies that are showing the breed and whatnot are from the local club. The other thing is there's a lot of camaraderie. You'll see vests. They come like a local club. They'll have a vest on. And they'll be embroidered with that local club's insignia on the front or on the back. And so, you know, okay, these are all from the, the German Lop Club of Rhineland. And you know them because of their, their coats or their vests and or their hats. And they have just these big social gatherings, it shows, even though they're stark competitors. I mean, every one of those guys, and for the most part in Europe, in continental Europe, it's predominantly men still showing rabbits and judging rabbits. Um, there's a few countries where there are more women getting involved in judging and showing. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, you see more and more. You now are seeing uh, a number of judges in Germany uh, who are women. Not as many women exhibiting yet in Germany. And in some other countries, you hardly see any women judges or judging. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of uh, just a nice hospitality camaraderie amongst the, the 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 people there you know even though they're stark competitors at in the end it's i'm happy for you and and let's go celebrate and they'll drag people in i mean i i i know a lot of them and i can walk by and next thing you know you know they grab my arm look come over here come. you know they're having a party in front of the cages and they decorate them with banners you know this is the champion but blah 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 of so and so and it, it's 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 just a festive atmosphere yeah, it's, it sounds like just a different atmosphere in general. It's, it's that is neat. Do uh, go, going back to what you were saying about, <clears throat> about buying the rabbits and stuff. So the, I mean, like, what's the price range of, of those animals? Would you so say just as very, You know, the the highest price country is the UK to, on all breeds. I mean, for some reason, um, you know, if you look in the world, the United States is the highest price country for rabbits in the world. You know, our prices are significantly higher than the other countries. And then right under that would be the UK. 
you know, and I don't know if it's because we're, we're very similar, but it is. And then you go to the other countries, um, like the Netherlands, uh, where you find an average price of a rabbit is, and again, it does depend somewhat on the breed, you know, and the quality in the breeder, but you'll see an average price of like 40 or 45 euros, you know, which now the dollar and the euro is very close. So it's almost equivalent, you know, 45 euros is probably, uh, maybe $46, you know, at the moment or, um, 45, 50, but it's, it's very close. And there's a few breeds, uh, you know, you get a bigger breed in, in, in the country and there'll be more. When you move over to Germany, prices are slightly more elevated. So, you know, a typical price over there may be 80 euros for uh, an average breed. But then when you look at your giants in, in Germany, they're at 100, 150, 200, 250 euros. They do put a maximum at the big shows that you can sell for. Um, 250 is the max. So I don't care what you think this rabbit's worth. Uh, 250 is the most you can put on it. And that's another thing about the two big shows in, in, in Germany. When you enter, the agreement is that you put up 50%, especially at the buck show, of your entry for sale. You must agree to sell it because the philosophy is that, okay, we want to improve quality. And if you're bringing four champion bucks here to win with, which is what everybody that enters wants to do, then you've got four animals of very good genetics. And two of those animals should be able to go to other breeders and help bring up the breed. So you have to decide the price and which two you're going to sell. You can sell all four, but you must sell at least half of them. And 250 is the most you can put. And the club will deduct. Not only does the club deduct, get percentage, but they also deduct some from the selling price as well. Do you then, that's what I think it's interesting though, is that like, it's just a predetermined price. The breeder ends up choosing how much they want to sell it for. But then um, anybody that goes up to that show office, from what you're saying, they just go in, buy it. And the, if they're the first one in line, they got, they're the one that gets it. Um, first come first, it's how fast you can run and how early you got to the show. So if you stroll in there at noon, uh, probably the rabbit that you really wanted is long gone because it was sold at seven o'clock. And literally, I mean, I've been there when they opened the gates on the inside watching. And it's like you opened up a, a cattle gate and you shot a gun and the stampede started. That's how hard they run. And they run that hard to be in these lines. And they'll have, you know, several cashiers. And it's quickly you know, I'm buying this rabbit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause there's, there's multiple of them that are, that are going ahead and doing it. Does yeah. Because the, your uh, buddy next door, you might hear the guy next door telling that lady, I want cage four Oh five too. And you're like, no, 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 no. Type quicker, you know, type thing. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 it's interesting that it's not like an auction format then at that point that, that, uh, you know, if, if, most people want the animal that it goes up to whatever the highest price is. It's interesting that it's just a flat, hey, this is the number, and you buy it and you move on. That's interesting. Do and you may never even see the breeder from which you bought the rabbit? Because in many cases, the clubs over there organize transport to a show. So Club uh, Rhineland says, okay, I've got 50 members here, and we're going to, and in many cases, the club owns trailers. So the club itself actually owns a trailer and they say, we're meeting at this, these points and we're picking up rabbits and we're going to take them to the big show for you. So these people take the rabbits, they check them in for you and you may or may not visit the show. You know, some people because of health issues and whatnot can't go and others say, okay, uh, they'll visit for a day, but the transport club brings them back. So you never even get to meet the person from which you bought the rabbit all thing you know is the person's name and address you know the rabbit score and that's it and you leave a piece of paper in the cage and that with your name on it and that goes back to the breeder and he may or may not know you that may not mean anything to them you know so uh fascinating now it's fascinating some breeders will be there and you can negotiate you know for example if you're there and you put your two rabbits up for sale and i know you and i go up david look you know how about selling one of these other rabbits? 
they can do that. The, the proper way is then to go to the show office and say, I am now selling, you know, Coop 505 uh, for this amount and he's going to buy it and they take care of it and they get their percentage and you get an official document. The, the other way that often happens is, OK, the show ends at four o'clock on Sunday. You come back four o'clock on Sunday. We walk through the outside and. I take it out or you take it out because it's your rabbit. And once it's out, then you say, okay, give me the money. And I take the rabbit and, and there's no percentage that happens too. And the other thing that happens is there are a lot of breeders who bring rabbits in their vehicles. So there are parking lot sales galore at some shows, you know, but that's typically I've called you up, David, do you have something? Yep. Yeah, I'll bring five. You know, you get to the show, you send me a message. I'm here. I go out to the parking lot. Here's the five. And I take them that sort of thing too. Yeah. That it's, it's more pre prearranged or predetermined. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. That's, that makes sense. So it is interesting to just hear how things are different. So then, so that catalog that you have though, they're, what there's you said that like a Saturday morning is when you're potentially going in to buy them to like so when are they so for them? example the big show um the rabbits for the big German show were checked in um normally they would be checked in on Tuesday but because they only had nine thousand this year they checked them in on Wednesday uh but typically a typical big national German show rabbits arrive on Tuesday they get all cooped then Wednesday and Thursday, they do two days of judging because typically you'll have, you know, 26, 27, 28,000 rabbits at these big German shows. And they're judged for Wednesday and Thursday. Then Friday is the day that all the records and everything get double checked, entered into the computer system, that sort of thing. The halls are decorated. You probably see from the pictures, you know, all the rabbit cages are skirted on the bottom, you know, with banners and there's decorations all through the hall, you know, the show hall and everything. They do that on Friday. And then, of course, they transmit all this data to the publisher, you know, on Friday. And then by, you know, the wee hours of the morning on Saturday, the publisher has to have, I mean, you know, this is a big, thick book with lots of little bitty type in it, a score for every rabbit in it that has to be ready to be passed out at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning at the big German show. And they sell the catalogs. You know, you buy your catalog and you buy entrance into the show hall uh, and the stampede begins. I just, I just can't believe that. I mean, I, and and I know that like at our national shows that we have we have the, the results catalogs too, but but to have that that much in there on each one and the the actual score and all that, it's incredible. And then to coordinate the sale of the animals as well and the sure. price of the animal. I mean, there's that that's just, I, yeah. I can't well, like I say even the small shows, you know, produce the same catalog after a day of judging. You know, for the people to come on Saturday and, and they've got the exact same you know kind of information in it. The breeders, the scores, everything in there. So, uh, um, I mean, it's just normal. Uh, and they do the same sort of thing, you know. Uh, the Netherlands produces the same sort of book, you know, with their scores and their. The other thing is, many of these shows, Germany shows are, are typically segregated into rabbit only shows and poultry only shows. But like here in the Netherlands, the National Association is a national association for rabbit breeders, poultry breeders, pigeon cage bird breeders, cavy breeders, mice, rats, all of that. So at the Nord Show in the Netherlands, you had all those species except for poultry because of avian influenza. It wasn't allowed this year, but in here, and you had the results of all of them. So you had the poultry, if they were shown in here, the pigeons, the cage birds, the cavies, the mice, the rats, everything, you know, in these books in that same sort of format and they have to produce them, you know, in a nice quality type type way. Um, National clubs also over there, each one produces for breeders what they call their their breeder book. You know, we used to get it. It would be from the ARBA that had all the members information in it. Well, they do the same thing over there still in a hard copy form that has and they give data. You know, they love their charts and their graphs. So even. In, in Belgium, they're doing data to show the members, you know, this is what's happening. This is not what's happening. 
um, that sort of thing. Hmm. The other thing that's unique about clubs, every year they publish these big books that give the details of what happened the year before. So this is the, the yearbook for the Netherland Dwarf Club. So in here will be every show that was produced. They have color pictures. It's all full of color pictures, show results, multiple articles, um, judging pictures, etc. And they produce this book every year, and it's included a part of the membership, which is very cheap, very cheap. And so well, that's, what get, that's what I'm curious on. How do they end up paying for it? I mean, those things cost money. So there is advertisement. I mean, if you look in the yearbook, you'll see it, you know, on the back. It's one of the largest feed companies in the Netherlands, Casper. So they solicit, you know, the same way we used to do in the ARBA. We would go out and get, you know, Kluber Tans and uh, Perina and all those companies to solicit and they would pay for it through advertising. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I mean, printing all that stuff is it definitely comes at a, an enormous cost. So that's, that's why I'm curious. Sure. Huh. Um, something before I forget that I know I was curious on. You had made a post, post on this a couple of years ago. Uh, about their feed uh-huh is are they are breeders over there feeding normal pellets like we are or are like is this more that they're feeding like something like this yeah so most of the breeders do feed some amount of pellet some will feed all pellets some feed a mixture of grain and pellets uh these bricks here that you can see have uh hay products in them they have grain products corn um sunflower seeds, uh, Johannes brot, uh, which is, uh, we call it carob here, uh, and, and other seeds are, are compressed in bricks. And then they often feed these as a supplement um, to their pellets. But almost all the breeders feed some quantity of pellet along with these things. And they also feed a ton of, of fresh vegetables and hay. I mean, uh, Hay is, is predominantly fed to the animals on a daily basis, as is uh, most breeders feed some sort of fresh vegetable to it. For years at the, at the big shows in Europe, you would go to a show and they would bed them down on hay and straw. And then during the, the three, four, five days that they stayed there, the rabbits were not watered. The, the source of water and nourishment was from uh, sliced rutabagas and carrots. Uh, most of them, because again of animal welfare, they they do water them and they do provide some sort of feed to them, you know, during the shows now. But uh, for years, uh, that wasn't the case. Hmm. What, I mean, what other what are what other vegetables are is a breeder actually using? Yeah, so they feed a lot of the root products. You know, the uh, the carrots, the rutabagas, anything uh, that's grown. Uh, you don't see. And, and then leafy products, the parsleys, the kales, the cabbages, the lettuces, um, uh, fennel, um, leeks, all of those sort of things. Dandelion grains are all huh. fed fresh. Huh. And most of them know like the herbal properties of some of the green things to feed. So, for example, you know, if you talk to a breeder, uh, over there and you said okay I've got a doe and she's not producing much milk this sort of thing then they would quickly say I'll oh, go get some fresh fennel and start feeding her fresh fennel and dandelion leaves and that helps produce uh, her produce more milk and of course then they would tell you okay before um, you have another litter with her start feeding those things a couple weeks in advance and then you wouldn't have the problem. That's, fast. that's fascinating I mean that's, some, that's something that uh... I would say it's not as commonly understood here in the U.S. Right, right. Um, and of course, you see corn in that, corn flakes. And, and you know, it's not atypical to walk by a show coop over there and see uh, corn on the cob, dried corn on the cob, you know, thrown into the cage for the rabbit to eat on. You know, corn is fed. It's, you know, here you say corn and, oh, wow, you know, it's taboo. We don't feed corn and... Uh, I found a flake of corn, you know, in my pellets, you know, my rabbits are going to die, that sort of thing. And you can see over there, 
it just this picture how much corn shows up just on the surface of it uh, and again corn cobs and and whatnot uh full of corn are given especially in the winter you know they're not going to necessarily feed so much corn when it's so hot outside but uh especially in the winter and um no problems i think they have a whole lot less uh, digestive problems with their rabbits over there when they're young than we have hmm. part of that too is because um you know they don't use for many anything that we would equate with a nest box you know the rabbit gets ready to have babies it goes to a corner of its cage which is solid floor it's got extra straw and bedding in there and it, it digs a hole and it has its litter, covers them up. And as soon as the baby then is ready to come out and eat, you know, it doesn't have to jump out of a, a ledge, you know, on a nest box to come out. It simply crawls out and it starts automatically. There's all this stuff, you know, here's the hay, here's the straw, here's the fresh vegetables. I can crawl over and, and get some pellets. I can get to water and they start growing and their digestive system adapts, you know, I think much easier than ours, which, you know, are in a box until they can leap out or we dump them out or something of that nature. And then, okay, it's time to make an adjustment. Um, so I think that that has a, a real difference in, in how rabbits grow, you know, between yeah. here and there. No, that is, that is, that is very interesting. You know, I, I posted a picture one time of some, oh, just a few week old rabbits coming out of a nest, eating uh, fresh vegetables. Somebody said, oh, you're going to kill them. You know, that's going to disrupt their digestive system, eating all that green stuff. And they're just barely out, you know, crawling around. And I'm like, no, no, this is normal. No problem. But but it's true. I mean, there are some things you can feed them that would cause issues. But but at the same time, you know, I mean, that a lack of knowledge, uh, you know, leads leads to that. Sure. Um, I, well, I do see one. Uh, you kind of already alluded to it, but the the master breeder thing. Um, like, what is is there something like legs and grand champions over there, or is it that master breeder type of thing? No, there's nothing that would equate to uh, our leg or our championship anything. Um, you know, pretty much it's, uh, you get medallions, you know, uh, you get in some shows, nice uh, silver cups, gold cups, that sort of thing. Uh, certificates, you know, are printed off with that, but uh, there's nothing to collect uh, for a rabbit or for a person uh, to get some award in the future it's this show this is what i won and basically it's a self-contained thing that's today you know and and i'll you know proudly publicize you know i was the german champion uh breeder from this show on this year or i had the german champion buck or something or uh, i had the best in show but but there's nothing given out that you would collect and add up and send off um uh, that would equate to anything we do. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was curious. I, uh, I didn't know. So, and um, nothing that we would, you know, nothing with points of any case, you know, like our sweepstakes. Uh, there's no sweepstakes system. Uh, there's no quality point system. So no one's tracking, you know, this rabbit won five best or was the champion. None of that data is tracked. Nothing. Um, huh. You, I mean, if you want to know, you go to a website, you know, somebody's website, you look it up or you collect, you know, all your, your show catalogs and, and that's the record, you know, type thing. And you can look it up. Okay. This is the person who had the, the top, whatever for this year. Um, but um, other than that, you know, they don't have a, a running board somewhere where you can go year after year and say, Oh, in, in 1980, this is the person who had whatever. You don't see that. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's neat getting to see differences and just how hobby, the hot, same hobby is uh, different in different places in the world. But oh, like, sure. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, you know, the first time you go, you don't know what to do because especially if you, if your first trip is to like one of the huge shows, you know, in Europe, you're just standing there. Okay. 
which aisle do I go down to and what do I look at first and what's going on? The one other thing we didn't talk about is um, this really different is the fact that in uh, many countries, the show is closed. So the only people in that building during the judging process are the show officials and the judges. So there are no exhibitors. There's, they're not allowed. So like uh, in the UK, you know, uh, the exhibitors can come and watch during the, the judging. But in most of the continental shows, there's some local shows where it's open and there's some lesser shows where it's open. But uh, for the most part, judging is closed. Judging officials, show officials, that's it. And, and you don't see public. You know, there's some media people from the press will be there and that sort of thing. So you don't see anybody, you know, um, standing there that's showing rabbits that's in a capacity of an exhibitor only. If there's people there helping, you know, that are showing rabbits, but they they have credentials, you know, around their neck that says, okay, I'm a, I'm a helper, I'm a carrier, I'm a whatever. And, and they have people walk around that will stop you very quickly. Wait a minute. Who are you? Where is your credentials? You know, what are you doing here? Because, because of people wanting to buy rabbits from all over Europe coming there, people try to slip in. And, and sometimes, you know, they can slip in a door or something, but they typically get caught. And if they're not supposed to be in there, they're politely shown the door and told, okay, we open at seven o'clock on Saturday. You know, you're welcome to come back type thing. But um, it's, a, it's a closed judging process. I find it fascinating that they can do that and then and still have the interest. Because I, I do think part of it is the atmosphere. Part of it is the, um, the excitement or anticipation of watching you work higher than the class. Go, oh, my God, you know, it's a class of 50 and I've still got one up there and then we're in the top five. And then it's the top four and then it's top three and I still got one in there. I just I can't. But of course, over there, it's only a, a class of one always. Because it's one rabbit, one rabbit comes up at a time. Oh, uh, because you're really just doing it off a point. So there's not that same anticipation. Yeah, I, you're just I mean, you would basically be waiting. OK, when does my rabbit come up and what is he going to say about it? You know, type thing, because they just bring them up one after the other one after the other one. And and the other thing is to keep them honest at the big shows because it's a system based on a group of four. So for the bigger shows, typically they will have four judges or a minimum of two judges and the group is split. So you're gonna take the odd numbers. So you're gonna take coop one and three of that group and judge it. And I'm gonna do two and four because you may be scoring high and I may be scoring low, okay, it's gonna balance. Or you may have, you know, know this tattoo for some reason and say, oh, well, you know, I'm gonna give it a little extra boost here because this always is good quality rabbits. I don't know it and I'm just judging it. So to relieve all of that possibility of favoritism, they always split the groups among a minimum of two judges and ideally four judges. And then again, you've got the supervising judge there who has to give the okay for anything above 96.5. So you've got a lot of checks and balances to try and keep it honest. Um, mm -hmm. But for in terms of anticipation, all the people who are showing rabbits there who don't have a job to work are back home now sending messages to everybody that they know working there during the day and saying, what did my rabbit do? What did my rabbit do? So at the end of the judging, when the cards are put up, the people who are helpers are all running around taking pictures, you know, the judging cards. And, and this is kind of the way the judging cards look, you know, they're long cards with a point score, that sort of thing on it, uh, taking pictures and sending them back, you know, to the people at home. And by the same token, the people who are at home wanting to buy rabbits, they're saying, okay, I want a, a German giant in the chinchilla color from this breeder. Can you go take a picture of the cards and coop numbers and send it to me because I'm not even going to buy a catalog. I'm just going to run straight to the cashier's office and ask for that number and hope that it's for sale. 
And, and literally, David, don't get in their way. I mean, do not. I mean, the best thing to do is get behind a bar, you know, a gate type enclosure and watch them run. <laughs> they mean business. It's amazing. It's just, it's, it's interesting to hear how that, how different that is there. Yeah. But there's a lot of passion. I mean, you can see it in them, you know, a passion for breeding animals, showing animals and uh, very focused. I mean, very focused, you know, uh, but it all centers around quality, quality, quality type thing. But yeah, the judging's closed. So, you know, if you don't have a friend on the inside, you don't know until you get a catalog or somebody sends you a page out of a catalog or, you know, they post it how your animals did, or you come that morning and you walk and you look at your cards. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, locked down totally. That's fair. That's, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other topics unless you have something else. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like I say, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of things, you know, once you start um, that are different. Um, but I think we've we've covered, you know, quite a few of them. I greatly appreciate your time and and doing this. And and, and I uh, was not anticipating it would be a, a two two almost two and a half hour conversation. Oh, however, wow. however, no, it was really it was really interesting. And